We're going to talk about corrections that you need to make to your magnetic uh, data, the magnetic data that you collect in the field. But first we're going to back up just for a minute and uh, come back to that problem that we dealt with where you had a dipole and at a point uh, 20 centimeters away from the axis of the dipole, a magnetic field intensity of 500 nanoteslas was measured and you were asked to figure out what the uh, pole strength was. So we went through this part and we basically stopped right here. And uh, common units of measurement when you're using a magnetometer, you will very often record magnetic field intensities in nanoteslas. Um, the nanotesla is not the basic CGS unit of um, magnetic field intensity. The, the uh, ersted is. So we had to convert from nanoteslas to ersteds. Now the basic unit for pole strength, you know, you, you could say, well, okay, fine, ersteds, ersted centimeter squared. But we should also remember we should make the point that an ersted centimeter squared is equal to one ups. So that our answer of 2.83 ersteds centimeter squared is good. Uh, we could also say that it was 2.83. Oops. I just wanted to kind of come back and uh, make that uh, uh, comparison of units. And so let's, let's take a look at the corrections that you would need to make to your magnetic field data. Remember, just quickly, uh, let's review the components of the Earth's magnetic field. Remember that it consists of a main magnetic field which varies from maximum to minimum by about 45,000 nanoteslas and is associated with currents flowing in the Earth's uh, liquid iron outer core. We also have remnant, uh, remnant magnetic field associated with the um, magnetic field of, you know, mostly with the magnetic field of crustal materials uh, at the Earth's uh, surface, near surface. And uh, in addition to that, we have fluctuations, which are some of which are predictable, uh, most of which are random, uh, that are associated with uh, currents that are generated in the Earth's ionosphere, associated with the bombardment of the uh, Earth by charged particles uh, carried in the solar wind. So those are the three components that um, you should keep in mind as you're making corrections. Now the main field has a the one that we were just looking at. It um, it does vary with time, but it varies fairly slowly. You know, so from one day to the next, you don't have to worry about the changes that you see over the interval of time that we have represented here over a 105 year interval of time from 1900 to uh, 2005. But as we pointed out earlier on, this 50,000 nanotesla uh, contour line that you see here on the right uh, used to be off here, kind of running through the northern part of Cuba and central part of Mexico. Uh, now it's running through um, South Carolina, uh, Georgia, and to Oklahoma and over through uh, uh, New Mexico, Arizona, and to California. Now that line over a hundred year period of time, we had this uh, secular drift. It's referred to as a secular drift over that 105 year period of time. This contour line moved up to here and you could do that for the other contour lines as well. So we do have these long term variations in the Earth's main magnetic field intensity that you do have to um, compensate for and that you would have to think about if you were comparing surveys conducted over uh, a several year, at intervals of a several, over several year time period. Now the uh, latitude correction, this brings us to the International Geomagnetic Reference Formula. And uh, this formula, uh, you, can, you can check this out at this uh, site here, the, uh, the NOAA site, and uh, you'll see this formula here for the potential uh, field associated with the Earth's main magnetic field. And it's an equation which describes the 
which which you can you know, plug in your latitude and longitude, and it will calculate the um, magnetic components, the components of the magnetic field at that location. Now, if we look at the gradient of this field, if we think about the corrections for latitude, the gradient of the field at about uh, 40 west, 80, 40 north, 80 west, somewhere over here in the uh, North American continent, is about 4.41 nanoteslas per kilometer. So, you know, if you were conducting a, a sizable, you know, a, a survey over a sizable area, you know, more regional in extent, uh, you know, even over a one kilometer area, you would have a change as you went a positive gradient going from south to north. Just like we have with gravity, although for entirely different reasons, but uh, we would increase the magnetic field, the, the regional uh, global magnetic field would increase by about 4.41 nanoteslas. So we would have, you would have that gradient superimposed upon um, the data that you would be collecting. So this would be an important contribution to remove, remove if you have a more extensive uh, survey. So uh, that's something to think about. And you can, <clears throat> you can get these components. You can see what the change is uh, for your latitude uh, just by going into this um, uh, calculator, which is also on the NOAA site plugging in your latitude and, and seeing how it does vary in your particular location. Now, variations of elevation would be something else that you would be concerned with, as we were with um, the, the Earth's gravitational field. With the Earth's gravitational field, uh, we, if you remember, the changes of uh, acceleration due to gravity with elevation were sig very significant. And, uh, you know, on the order of 0.3 milligauss per meter, and we're often looking for anomalies that are in the milligal range. So you had to know your elevations pretty accurately, and you had to correct for them. With magnetic fields, the change in the magnetic field intensity with elevation is on the order of about uh, three, uh, 2.7 hundredths per meter, 2.7 uh, hundredths of a nanotesla per meter. So not over, um, well, that, that would be over a one kilometer change in elevation. But, but, but it tends to be, you know, on average about, about 0.027 now. It does vary with latitude. But you, again, would want to check, and you could do this. Here we have a, a measurement at one kilometer above sea level. Here we have a measurement at uh, sea level. You can see that we've gone from 51,967.5 at sea level. Uh, the magnetic field intensity is less one kilometer above sea level by about this 0 0.027 nanoteslas per meter. So uh, if you're just going up and down a, a few meters, uh, you're probably looking at, uh, um, you know, something less than a nanotesla. And most magnetometers uh, and most of the anomalies that you'll be looking for will be uh, multi-nanotesla in uh, magnitude. <clears throat> Probably the most important uh, corrections that you need to make in your survey are those associated with the short-term fluctuations uh, in the magnetic field that are associated with those geoelectric currents that we were talking about, the bombardment of uh, the Earth by the uh, solar wind. And uh, you can see that even during a quiet day, we can have 10 gamma fluctuations over a fairly short period of time. Here we have a, a, a day scale. And if you do have a solar storm, a magnetic storm, uh, you're going to see some fairly rapid variations in the uh, magnetic field intensity, which, is, which are going to make it difficult for you to uh, correct your data uh, to, to remove something which is as rapidly varying as this is. Now, you can go again to uh, the NOAA site. You can see how the, in, in this example here, uh, how the total magnetic field intensity is um, uh, varying. Uh, and, and this is at a Lagrangian point. And um, we'll, talk, we'll talk about that briefly in a minute. But I'd also note that the 
Solar activity does vary with that 11-year sunspot cycle. And during periods of sunspot minima, it's, you're much less likely to run into significant uh, variations in the Earth's magnetic field associated with uh, solar flares and solar activity. And you can see here uh, we have um, variations in, in sunspot activity associated with these cycles. At present, we're kind of exiting uh, cycle number 24. This is a prediction of that cycle, and it seems to have borne out fairly well. And you can look at these, um, <coughs> these websites to get uh, additional information. So the Solar, solar wind is not measured on the Earth's surface, so when you're looking at the solar wind measurements from a satellite, that satellite is located in an L1 Lagrangian point, and that is shown over here, uh, between the uh, Sun and the Earth. So it would be out beyond the orbit of the Moon. And the Lagrangian point is just a point of minimum potential, these different Lagrangian points. And we have large and negative potentials associated with the sun and with the, um, and with the earth. And the potential is negative because you have to do negative work. You're basically falling. You don't have to do any work. So it's kind of a negative work that you have to do when you fall. So, um, okay. So other sites that may be of interest to you just to see how things vary during, during the course of a day or over a three-hour period, I believe, in this case. And you can go to this site here and run this, um, run these viewers through so that you can see how the magnetic field was varying, uh, has been varying in your area in the past uh, three hours, 24 hours, three days, and so on. So these are all useful sites to keep up with uh, space weather. And you can also get an activity forecast. What, are, what might you expect in the um, remainder of the day, tomorrow, the next day, in terms of uh, solar activity? So some useful sites that you may want to want to look at. The thing about these variations are that they're random, so that <clears throat> these are your, you know, really your largest non-geological variations that you have to. Uh, compensate for, and we would usually compensate for these variations by reoccupying a base station periodically throughout the duration of your survey, just like we did with, with gravity, and you would reoccupy that station and correct your data relative to that, uh, to those variations in magnetic field intensity that you measure at a base station. So again, much the same way we did with tide and instrument drift with gravity observation. So this would be probably the most, you know, for most local surveys, this would be the one correction that you would really want to pay attention to. And we've given you several um, uh, websites to uh, uh, learn more about those variations and um, how they may change in your area. Another <coughs> feature that we talked about when we talked about gravity was the regional field and removing the regional field. And we did that by uh, separating the, uh, separating out what was a residual field. And we did that by, um, we did that by surface fitting and line fitting to the uh, field data that you collect. And uh, these regional fields may be associated with deeper crustal materials. You really aren't interested, let's say, or this could be the latitude effect. You want to remove it. You just want to look at the relative variation, so you're interested in the residual. And um, your regional anomaly could be nonlinear. It could be linear. Uh, the idea is to remove it so that you can look at the relative variations, the variations in the magnetic field intensity relative to that regional component. So these, these might be the shallower features uh, that, that you're interested in. So next time we're going to be talking about magnetic potential, its relation to force, and we'll also derive the dipole potential and field intensity. So uh, hope you'll join us then. See you later.